One, two, MatPat's coming for you. Three, four, with a theory about gore. Five, six, throw some science in the mix. Seven, eight, gonna settle the debate. Nine, ten, Freddy won't kill again. Hello, Internet. <laughs> Hello, Internet! Welcome to Film Theory! Admittedly, it's scary these days. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world and things feel really out of control, so today, we're taking control back into our own hands. We're taking one of the scariest, most powerful monsters in all of horror cinema, one who attacks when we're most helpless, when we're asleep, and we're beating him at his own game. We're learning how to defeat the dream killer, Freddy Krueger. Loyal theorists, Grandpappy Mad Pat wants to take you on a stroll down memory lane to the time when he was a wee little child and still went to Blockbuster. For you see kids, in those days, Blockbuster still existed. Now, I love the video store, partially for the video game rentals, partially for the Sour Patch Kids, and partially for the mystery of whatever was in that back room with the red light that my dad liked so much. Was it World War II documentaries? Knowing my dad, it was probably World War II documentaries. Yes. I'll never know. Anyway, my other memories of going to Blockbuster include timidly walking down the horror movie aisle. My young mind curious about all those scary R-rated movies that I was too young and too much of a chicken to watch. I was always careful not to stop and look too long at any of the boxes because even those were enough to give me nightmares. A giant shark looming under an unsuspecting swimmer? Still the reason I don't swim. Death Spa. You'll sweat blood. Still the reason I don't exercise. A green ghoulie popping out of the toilet? Still the reason I don't... Well, you get the idea. Prep an extra set of bedsheets, Ma, cause Baby Pat is waking up damp. But of all the best 80s horror classics that dominated those VHS displays, A Nightmare on Elm Street is probably the most memorable. For one, just because there are so many of them. After the original came out in 1984, the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise created four sequels in less than five years. It's a release calendar that would make the likes of Scott Cawthon jealous. But as a kid with just a passing knowledge of the horror movie universe, Freddy is probably the monster who scared me the most. Sure, Jason Voorhees is more imposing and bloodthirsty, but I didn't go to camp. Or space, for that matter, which seemed like the main prerequisite for getting killed by him. Pinhead? Yeah, can't solve a Rubik's Cube to save my life. But Freddy Krueger? A monster who attacks in your dreams? Seems like cheating. To make matters even creepier, Wes Craven was inspired by the real story of several refugees who died suddenly and inexplicably in their sleep. Something we just talked about recently over on Game Theory, in fact. Link is in the corner. But yeah, Freddy is not only inescapable, he's actually based on something real. What defense do we have against all of that? None. Or so I thought for the last 25 years. But friends, today it's time to put Freddy to sleep for good. That's right, theorists. You can all sleep a little tighter tonight after watching this episode because we're going to show you how to survive Freddy Krueger and keep him confined to dreamland once and for all. Turn out the lights and tuck yourself in. It's time to put Freddy to Betty. And yeah, I know that line was cheesy, but it's on brand for these movies. I mean, have you heard the lines this guy uses? His Puns are worse than mine. This is it, Jennifer. Your big break in TV. I rest my case. The first step in learning how to defeat Freddy Krueger is to study all the times that he's been defeated in the past, to see if we can get any pointers from there. And so I called in the expert, the master of all things horror and gore here on YouTube. It's none other than James A. Janice from the YouTube channel Dead Meat, the man who is most known for counting all the dead bodies in every single horror movie out there, a concept that I may or may not have ripped off for my Disney Death series. I just loved his work, but figured he wouldn't do it to Mulan anytime soon, so I took it upon myself. James, what do you got to say about Freddy? Hey, buddy, thanks for including me in this video. In the original A Nightmare on Elm Street, Freddy is pulled out of the dream world and is burned by a Molotov cocktail. Except that doesn't quite finish the job. Our final girl, Nancy, realizes that without fear, Freddy has no power, so she just turns her back on him and he vaporizes. Apparently, Freddy's life force is roughly the same as Tinkerbell's, because if you ignore them, they die. Only in Freddy's case, he comes back, and in A Nightmare on Elm Street 2, Freddy's Revenge, he possesses a teenage boy to kill for him, until his girlfriend sees the only way to defeat Freddy is by kissing him and freeing her boyfriend's soul that's trapped inside of him. In A Nightmare on Elm Street, 
Wave 3, Dream Warriors, Freddy is a terrorizing a pediatric psych ward, and we get the backstory that he's a real son of a nun whose bones need to be laid to rest. This time he's killed when his bones are doused in holy water and topped with a cross because of, uh, the power of Jesus, I guess. A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, the Dream Master, gives Freddy the Medusa treatment when our new final girl, Alice, recites a nursery rhyme and makes Freddy look at his own reflection. That causes the souls inside of him to rip him to shreds. One of his souls is played by Linnea Quigley. Fun fact. The fifth installation, The Dream Child, has Freddy lose to his demon apprentice who turns Freddy into a baby. It's just as stupid as it sounds. Other installments kill Freddy via bomb, decapitation, throat attack. So basically, we've got two takeaway lessons here. One, there is no reliable or consistent way to kill Freddy and prevent him from ever coming back. And two, not even dream demons are immune to dope rhymes. Nursery rhymes, that is. So if there's no offensive strategy to kill Freddy, then what are our defensive options for keeping him from killing us? The first is the most obvious one. Don't sleep. I know just what you're saying, and it's duh. Unfortunately, this isn't the best solution. Not because we're bad at not sleeping, quite the contrary, in fact. According to the CDC, one in three Americans isn't getting enough sleep, and that's without us even trying. No, the problem is that we will always, always end up falling asleep at the end of long periods of staying awake. In the 1960s, a high school student named Randy Gardner broke the record for the longest stretch of being awake at 11 days, 25 minutes, which he did for a school project. But you know what he did when it was all over? Fall asleep for a total of 25 hours spread across two days. And Freddy is a patient man. He waited several years between being burned by the parents of Springwood, Ohio, and eventually taking his revenge on their kids. So even if you stay up for a solid week playing Minecraft, he'll catch you right when you're about to start dreaming of diamond armor. I mean, you could try to push Randy Gardner's record, but that's also going to run you into a lot of problems. There are no known cases of a human death caused by a simple lack of sleep, but tests have been done to monitor the effects of extreme sleep deprivation on lab rats, because apparently scientists are in a constant competition to see who can kill rats in the most creatively cruel way possible. After about a month, all the rats were dead due to mysterious reasons, but suspected all the reasons were tied back to their lack of sleep. Again, I go into way more detail about all of these things over on that Game Theory episode. It's almost as if these two episodes were meant to be watched together and somehow the programming schedule got shifted in some way. Huh, go figure. Anyway, suffice it to say that the length of time which humans could stay awake without dying is probably not identical to that of rats, but there's no reason to believe that it'd be significantly longer. So basically, we find ourselves in a catch-22 here. If you sleep, Freddy is gonna kill ya. If you don't sleep, your body is gonna kill ya. So what is the answer then? Well, remember that Freddy isn't just a killer who attacks in our sleep, he's a killer who attacks in our dreams. No dreams, no Freddy. We're not always dreaming when we sleep. Realistically, the vast majority of our dreams, and pretty much any dream you'd actually remember, takes place during rapid eye movement, or REM cycles of sleep. I would insert another 90s music joke here, but you know, copyright issues. So just know that the thought was there, and it's just a missed opportunity for everyone. REM sleep usually occurs in about 10 minute bursts at the end of the sleep cycle, which lasts roughly 90 minutes. The longer you sleep, the longer those REM cycles will become. So one possibility is sleeping for shorter periods that prevent us from going into REM. And that brings us to our next candidate to defeating Freddy, polyphasic sleep. Most people engage in what's known as monophasic sleep. You're awake all day, you go to bed for one long stretch at night, you wake up, you rinse, you repeat. Polyphasic sleep, on the other hand, seeks to boost productivity by giving people shorter, separated periods of sleep throughout the day. It was allegedly used by Leonardo da Vinci, who I think I can safely say was a reasonably productive dude. The most popular versions of polyphasic sleep tend to still have a longer stretch of sleep at night with some naps sprinkled throughout the day, but both the Uberman and Dymaxian models call for no more than 30 minutes of sleep at a time. Foolproof plan, right? not so fast. For one, medical professionals are very dubious about the benefits of polyphasic sleep. A doctor from the UCLA Sleep Disorder Center was quoted in Time Magazine as saying, quote, there is very little data, none whatsoever in the medical literature, of carefully designed clinical studies demonstrating that polyphasic sleep has any advantage in human sleep medicine, end quote. Well, thanks a lot, Dr. Killjoy. But even if polyphasic sleep isn't exactly good for you, it's still a cheat code to getting around REM sleep, right? Nope. Once you start depriving your body of sleep, it 
it actually starts to enter REM sleep faster than it otherwise would. A big selling point for people who advocate polyphasic sleep is that it should in fact increase the amount of time that you're spending in REM sleep. So paradoxically enough, less sleep actually means more REM, and more REM means more dreams, and more dreams means more Freddy. So the real question is how do we sleep while avoiding REM altogether? And that requires a little more understanding of how REM works in the brain. Most of the neural activity that takes place during REM sleep comes from the brainstem, in particular the pontine tegmentum and the locus coeruleus. But if you're thinking we can just deactivate those parts of the brain, or any other parts that contribute to REM and dreaming, that's sort of like dealing with a clogged toilet by burning down your house. Take away much function from the brainstem and all of a sudden you're gonna have a lot of problems with muscle control, including the ones that you need to pump your heart and help you breathe. So if the goal is still not to die, well, that's a no-go solution. There are some very early indications that REM can be turned on and off by the activation of certain neurons, but this has only occurred in mice that were genetically engineered to have certain receptors to allow scientists to control their brains that way because, again, scientists are just bored little kids who make rats stay awake until they die and like to control mouse brains with lights. So from the brain's electrical perspective, you're probably stuck with REM sleep. But there are also chemical reactions in your brain that are required for REM to take place. And that, my friends, is where we finally find our answer. For the chemical reaction to trigger REM sleep, our brain needs to produce a lot of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine, and they need to eliminate monoamine neurotransmitters like norepinephrine and serotonin. You don't really want to get rid of your brain's ability to produce acetylcholine, as that's going to lead to issues like weakness, fatigue, cognitive impairment, constipation, chronic inflammation. However, if you can keep your brain from removing those other neurotransmitters, the monoamine neurotransmitters, you can nip REM sleep right in the bud. And lucky enough for us, there's a whole class of drugs that'll do exactly that. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors, also known as MAOIs, are a class of antidepressants that were developed in the 1950s and are still being used today, though less often than the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors or SSRIs that many are familiar with, to treat things like panic disorders, atypical depression, PTSD, and other conditions. The whole job of MAOIs is to promote the brain's production of the exact neurotransmitters that the brain needs to sweep away in order to produce REM sleep. People who take MAOIs have been observed to have their REM sleep effectively eradicated from their nights. Now, I know what you're gonna say. Okay, Matt, Pat, but there's always a catch. Now you're gonna tell me that not having REM sleep is gonna make your eyes bleed or turn your toes into cocktail sausages or something weird. And I understand why you'd think that. I do like throwing in that there's a catch. But in this case, the twist is that there is no twist. Multiple scientists have described people without REM sleep as experiencing no real defects and being at no particular health risk. So interestingly enough, if you've got panic attacks or PTSD as a result of Freddy Krueger, the same drugs that you would have taken to address the effects are actually the same drugs that you're gonna need to get rid of the cause in the first place. Those are the things that are gonna keep you safe. More monoamine neurotransmitters equals less REM sleep equals zero Freddy. Wait a second. If Freddy Krueger is defeated by antidepressants, does that mean that the whole Nightmare on Elm Street franchise is about mental illness? This idea of a silent killer, one only you can see that operates in your brain and can be deadly if it's not dealt with? It makes a lot of sense. Maybe a Nightmare on Elm Street was actually more sensitive, more culturally aware, more subtle than we could have ever thought. <laughs> or, you know, Maybe not. Not all theories can be winners. But hey, do me a favor and go check out James's channel, Dead Meat. Like I said, his channel is great. If you are a fan of horror movies, then, well, chances are you've probably seen his channel here on YouTube because he is the man when it comes to counting all the deaths in your favorite and also least favorite, never before heard from horror movies out there. Anyway, his channel is great, his podcast is great, and he is just a fantastic, really nice guy. So please show him some love, click the link that you see on screen, and leave in the comments below that you came from the Film Theorist channel and I don't know if you could do me a favor and work into your comment the word uh, dongle. If you could say the word dongle somewhere in your comment that would be awesome. You could say like hey Matt Pat sent me stop stealing his dongle. So anyway thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you for showing James from Dead Meat some love and remember that's just a theory. A film theory and sweet dreams.